me to Mark chapter 10. Today we're going to read from verse 1 to 12. For some weeks now, we've been looking at covenant and the fact that our God is a covenant-keeping God. He's a God of promise. And whatever he says concerning our lives, he ensures that it does come to pass. And last, a couple of weeks ago, we, we looked at a scripture in Isaiah chapter 62 where God refers to us as his bride and how he will marry us and how we will, he will find delight in us. And so if you missed that, please, and even if you didn't miss it, please get the CDs from the bookshop, the DVDs, as you refresh your memory. We were talking about covenant in marriage and how marriage is a covenant established by God and is God's idea and about how God himself sees us as his bride and how he has a covenant relationship with you and I in that covenant marriage. In Mark chapter 10, verse 1 to 12, I read, it says, Then Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, he replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Verse 5, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against them. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Amen. We're still talking about uh, the covenant relationship. And this is a perfect example about Jesus doing, going about his business. The Bible said that wherever he went, he was doing good. And as he was on earth to preach the gospel, he, wherever he went, he preached. And this was no exception. The Bible says Jesus left that place and he went, obviously, if you want to find out where he had been, you read the preceding chapter. And he went into Judea and he went across the Jordan. It says, again, crowds of people came to him and as was his custom, he taught him. That's for another thing. One of the things that I'm interested in, what Jesus' custom was. His custom was to pray regularly and stuff like that and also to teach. That's what he came to do. And we pray, as I've been praying this year, and I'm sure you've been joining us in prayer, that the Lord will increase this ministry amen because that is our portion he's given us specific instructions that we should pray for the lord of the harvest wherever the lord jesus went and wherever the gospel is preached people must be drawn to the gospel and we pray for that unction in this house amen and one of the things that while you're praying watchmen put this in your closet one of the scriptures i like is in corinthians and paul writing to the corinthians says this he says for i came to you not with enticing words of man but with the power and demonstration of the gospel Paul was a very learned man, but at that particular time, he was telling that I come to you not because I have a degree, not because I, I'm, I'm very skilled, but any time I come to you, there is evidence and power, a demonstration of the gospel so that people cannot help. But so, ooh, so they don't sit down and judge that he's learned. We are, thank God that our apostle of the house, our super apostle is very learned. Amen. We must increase our prayer so that it will be evident. Amen. That as it comes, it will not be so much the eloquence of speech, but the power and demonstration. Uh, is somebody here with me? Amen. That's our prayer topic because that's what uh, followed Jesus' ministry. But anyway, it says that there's some Pharisees came and listened to the word. I don't know what translation you have, but the words here says, and tested him by saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? By the word tested, it means that they wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. It would seem that either they knew what he would say or they want to put him in a situation where he would say something that would be wrong that they can say, you see, this is even Jesus said this. Or he may say something that would give them the leeway to continue to commit sin. Do you understand? Not that he would make them sin. But you know sometimes you say something, somebody wants to do something and you are just genuinely saying something. Ah, even pastor said we can do that. But what did pastor exactly say? So they actually take the word and... and 
and maneuver it to suit them. So that's what the Pharisees did. And any time the Pharisees came, they must have always had some kind of hidden agenda. So they come and ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Then Jesus says to them, what did Moses command you? And they did say rightly, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And that is true. If you look in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses, before he died, the Bible tells us that Moses was a friend of God. Moses is the one, the Bible says, God speaking in Exodus, he said, I reveal myself to prophets and all that. He says, I reveal myself to them in visions and in dreams. But with Moses, I communicate with him face to face. So he was of a different spirit, Moses was. And the Bible clearly tells us that any time Moses spoke, it became law. Sometimes, just like Paul would say, he said, this one is from me. But he's saying that once, even though he's saying it's from me, it is law because he speaks on the behalf of God. And that is the unction that you and I carry in the name of Jesus. That as you declare a thing, that's what the Bible says, you will declare a thing and it will come to pass. When your heart and your soul is intertwined with God, it might even be that you did not hear the Lord say, but immediately you say it, God honors that word. And that is the unction you carry. And that's the unction, if you don't carry, you must activate it so that you can get yourself. The Bible says, in the book of Hebrew that these people by constant use and have training have put themselves in that position you must train yourself because that is our unction amen so we can declare things and it will come to pass but Moses in Deuteronomy did say that he said that look if your wife is you know doing this so you're displeased with your wife you can divorce your wife give your wife a certificate of divorce and then do what let her go and so some people were doing that the interesting thing about the divorce is, is so the Pharisees write, said, they said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of and it, it was sent away. After a while, it seemed like in those days, um, do, after Moses made that law, people would divorce for all manner of reasons. At that particular time, reading between the lines, I found that, that there were two schools of thought concerning divorce, which is why the Pharisees were coming to Jesus to test which one you're with. So one school of thought, now I don't remember the names, so never mind the names of the people. But the idea is that if your wife burns your food, you can divorce your wife. If your wife talks too loudly, maybe the neighbors can hear, hey, you can say, you know what, you're gone. So you could divorce your wife. Basically, you can just get up one morning and say, I don't like that colors you're wearing. It doesn't coordinate. So, bye-bye. You can go. So, people were divorcing for all manner of reasons. Then there was the other school of thought that said that. You could not divorce your wife unless it's based on adultery. Okay? That you, they, they broke a covenant, which is adultery. And the New Testament also bears that bit up. And so, there were so many reasons why people were divorcing. The interesting thing that you must bear in your mind before we move on was that at that particular time, number one, men were allowed to marry, marry more than one woman, like we all know, and pastors taught us many, many times. That actually, and uh, I think, uh, well, God sanctioned uh, multiple marriages. So you could marry 100 wives if you could afford to keep them. So if that being the case, then you go back to the theory, why would you, I mean, if your wife is not color coordinated, you can, instead of saying I want divorce, you can say, go back, bring Jane. Jane, you're wearing the right clothes. I will go with Jane instead of you. You can stay at home. You burn the food. Never mind. I don't want to eat the food. Let's call Jane because Jane cooks better. So do you understand? So if, if that being the case, you can argue to yourself, was there actually a need for divorce? Question mark. Num number two, women were of a subservient nature, so much so that women were like properties. So you count your cows, your camel, your sheep, your goat, and then you count your wives. So women were possession. So with that, if a woman was not married, they'd have to stay in their father's house. So once they marry, and they leave their father's house, they go to their husband's house. So the woman is the husband's property. It's the husband's responsibility to ensure that they look after this woman. Because if they were to divorce the woman, remember we're not talking about now. Yeah, now in actual fact, most women even earn more than their husbands. They're more financially secure. Some women, frankly, don't need, you understand, they, they're economically sound. 
So if they're going to a relationship, they're not going in it because they want to have economic power. Do you understand what I mean? So now the tables at 10 is a different thing altogether. But in those days, if your husband got rid of you, you are literally destitute. Because you have no man to look out for you. You cannot go back to your father's house because you've become used goods and you are a disgrace to your father's house. So basically, you are destitute. Are you with me? So, and remember that we've already established the fact that marriage was a covenant. And God himself had said, and Jesus quotes that again from Genesis chapter 2, that for this reason, a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife and the two become one flesh. So that is the covenant relationship. We're still talking about covenant. So Jesus is asking them and saying now, okay, now what is it that Moses said? And so God is telling you and I that covenant relationship is extremely important. In those days, covenant relationship was important because you have to stick to covenant. And Jesus answers them with that little background. We'll come back to it in a minute. It says, it was in verse 5. It said, Moses allowed it. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. Jesus wrote the line. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, the man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, verse 8, what God has joined together, let no one separate. God is talking to you and I about covenant relationship. He himself has covenanted with you. That I will never leave you, neither will I forsake you. That you may know that I am your helper. He himself has covenanted from the very beginning that because of this sin and separation, I'll bring my redeemer, that is my son, to die for you so that you and I can always remain in covenant relationship. Then God has uh, equated the covenant relationship he's in with as that a marriage. And he is saying he is our husband. When we read Isaiah 62, he said that I will marry you. In my verse, she said, my builder will marry you. It's talking about a relationship, a covenantal relationship. I am your husband. So every responsibility a husband has to look out for you, to protect you, to make sure you're not destitute is there for you. So in the scripture, God is reminding you and I that. He says, at the beginning, it was not so. My intention at the beginning was to have a covenantal relationship with me, with you. And I still hold on to it. The reason why divorce came into you because your hearts were, your hearts were hardened and you were going away and de- abusing what I had originally intended. Remember that Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. He came to make sure that all things were perfect, things that were not were working correct. And he came to ensure that the covenant relationship that he has for us from the beginning was sealed and can continue. Amen. And so God is talking to you and I that he is a covenant keeping God. In the same vein, just like I was giving an example, that people would, 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 give, would divorce their wives for trivial reasons. Now, I've given you some of the reasons. There could be others. Oh, you know, your hairstyle is not looking good. You've put on weight. Uh, and, you know, t- frankly, it sounds ridiculous. You've burnt the food. You're not color coordinating. You shouted too much. You, you're not this or that. For whatever reason, they would break their relationship. Now, I hear you say, well, that sounds really trivial. But today, we want to look at ourselves and say, the covenant relationship that we also have committed to God in, at what point do we break it? And many a time, we look at the covenant and we break outside of the covenant for trivial, relationship, for trivial reasons. Well, I'm not going to that church again. Even though I have covenanted that I'm going to be a church member. In fact, I'm a member of the choir. But you know what? I'm going to stop going to the choir. And then after that, some people, they actually plan their exit. You know that. What, what happens is that maybe they get offended. Instead of us to follow the prescribed, you know, grievance procedure in the Bible, we don't do it. Yeah, that's why God knows all things. Amen. He knows all things. God is like a mother. Mothers, we know all things. Happy Mother's Day. But God knows all things. That is why he put it in the scripture that if somebody offends you, what you're to do, you're to approach them and speak to them. If they don't hear you, you go and get an elder and say blah, blah, blah. And then the elder calls the person. And if they don't hear, the elder can maybe report the matter to the pastor. See, that's a grievance procedure. You see that at work, don't you? If this, you go through that procedure. And then once you've hit the pastor and the person still says, Mm-mm, then the Bible says you treat them like an unbeliever. 
You could just say, you know this one, that person is not part of our covenant because they're not sticking to covenant. You see how important covenantal relationships are with God. With God. But you know what we do? Somebody's offended us and then we say to ourselves, me, never again will I give that person an opportunity. So that person is in the choir or in the welcome team, whatever department that you're in. So you say to yourself, because of that person, I'm not going to go to that department anymore. It's choir uh, practice today. You don't go. Oh, um, you may have the thing, you, politeness to call your leader. Oh, um, you know, today I'm working. Lie. The next day, then after you got to the third day, you plan it all. About the third week, I will not be out phoning at all. You don't bother going. Next minute, you're sitting here. Next minute, you move to that bit. Yeah, so that bit is part of the choir, yeah? The next minute, you're sitting here. The next minute, and you see that people are actually planning their escape. And get to the point where they say to themselves, you know what, I'm gone. I will not come back to this church. Well, in my opinion, that's a trivial thing because you have covenanted in the good and the bad because we're looking about marriage. And we all know about marriage vows and we did discuss it at length when we started looking at marriage covenant. It says in sickness and health. In good and in bad. And then we use that scripture. When the fig tree does not blossom. When there's no sheep in the pen. And we use Job. And it says, even though he slays me, yet will I praise him. These are words of a covenanted people. Whether it's going good, bad, or ugly. But sometimes we look at things and we don't weigh the covenantal relationship we have with God. And the things that are trivial. The things that don't matter. We allow those things to allow us to break covenant. Remember, God is a true God. His word is true and he always sticks to covenant he is playing his part and keeping up his bargain but you and I are withdrawing ourselves we just like those Pharisees who will break covenant under, uh, under and any excuse but Jesus is telling you and I that that was not God's original intention and that is why he's taking us back to I think it's John Major's government that would say, use the term, we're going back to basics. I know some of you don't remember a free history lesson, but John Major would say, we're going back to basics. We're going back to our, our foundations. We're going back. So if you want to go back to basics in the beginning, and the book of Genesis is a very important book that we should not sideline, because in there is all God's thoughts, his intentions, his hopes, his visions, his, 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 his intentions, his beliefs, and everything, his blessings that he has for you and I is right there at the beginning. So Jesus is telling you and I that it is in the beginning it's not so. But he says that he created said for this reason and like I said he said the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Verse 9 very interesting and we hear this at weddings. It says therefore what God has joined together let no one separate. Another translation will say, therefore, what God has put together, let no man, I think it goes, no, let no one put asunder. And asunder is a very good word. It, it's almost like, for me, the, the picture it gives me is like you've got some thread and you just pull in a, a cloth apart and you make sure that you, you shred it completely. And so God, this is Jesus speaking here, he said, that, so therefore, Remember the beginning that you are in a covenant relationship. When God set out the beginning, he does not intend for you and I to break away from him. He intends for us to continue to remain in him. He doesn't intend for us to have a divorce. He intends that we will continue that relationship from the first day of our birth to the dying day. Amen. That's why we say in our marriage covenant, till death do us part. The only thing that should separate a marriage covenant is death. In the same way, the only thing that should separate us from God's covenant is death. But even we thank God that even when we die it's even a continuation of our covenant with him. Amen. So Paul wrote, he said, what is it that will separate me from the love of God? Is it famine? Is it tribulation? Is it, I mean, when you read it, don't you wonder to yourself, wow, because Paul had got himself and trained himself to the point that he knew that he was sold out. And that is the same Paul that said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because he was a covenanted person and he knew that he was locked into God. Is it death? And it's the same Paul that writes to Corinthians. He said, don't grieve like those who have no hope. And he says this, death, he speaks to death. He said, death, where is your word sting and grave? Where is your victory? He's even speaking to death. And he's saying that, you know what? One thing that we haven't got control over is death. You know, sometimes 
and you will hear the doctor say, thank God we have an experience. The doctor will say, I'm sorry, there is nothing we can do. Because even regardless of all that, they realize that at this point now, it's always out of their hands. And the, the one thing we have no control over is death. But God, who is a covenanted God, is able. That's why even in the grave, he is Lord. Even in the grave, he is Lord. For he's saying that he's the Lord of the living and of the dead. He is the Lord of the living and the dead. And he continues his covenant even after death. And that is why when we get to the time where we die, we die, we continue in his covenant relationship. So the covenant relationship he has with you and I is forever. And so it, death, in our, as far as we're concerned, it is death that will separate us. I mean, you understand, even though obviously afterwards we continue. So the relationship that we have with God in our personal covenantal relationships, our covenantal relationship where coming to church is concerned, where we worship him, how we pray with him, how we um, grow our relationship with him, how we serve him in his house. It is forever. And the Lord expects us to, just like at the beginning he meant, that the relationship will go on forever. And so to be honest, in 20 years time, when we come to church, I should still see the same old faces plus the new. We, we, we get to a point that we just hate routine, isn't it? Are you still at that church? Eh? Hey, how, how long has it? How long have you been there? You know, sometimes we ask, we say, oh, are you still working at JB and Co? So, uh, so, uh, that's a long time. You will feel guilty that you, can, you say that, or oh, I'm still working there. But when it comes, because those things happen to us where our work is concerned, we translate that into the house of the Lord. Not so our relationship with God. Just like when you marry, when you, when, um, you marry and you come to your 50th year, somebody should not look at you and say, ah, are you still married to your husband? That's odd, isn't it? And that is why God equates his love and his covenant with us to marriage. Because we do expect, don't we? Even now, we do expect that our marriages will last, what, long. I always say the word I love most in my language in tree is marriage. Because the word for marriage is long. And I just like that. It, it is a, oh, so I am in long. I'm going to long. It doesn't make sense. But it makes sense. Because what is saying that the, the institution you are entering is long. It is forever. And so the, you should, it, should be, it should be your pride. When a new member comes and says, hello, I'm Dorothy. Um, I have been a member of FCI for 20 years. The new member should look and say, oh, wow. That's wonderful. Not like, oh, um, how long? <laughs> Let me go and try out that. They said the new church has come around the corner. Let me go and try it out because I've been here too long. Not in this case, amen. The Lord expects that where you find yourself, because the promises that he has for you and the blessings he has for you, they are for eternity, amen. And even he says, for I am the God who keeps my covenant of love to a thousand generations. So the covenant of love that he has for you, he doesn't even have it just for you. He could have said that. You see, that's why he promised David. He said that as long as I live, I am God. They will never cease to be somebody from the line of David on the throne of Israel. That's a blessing, all right? But he could have said that as long as you live, David, nobody will, will usurp you of the throne. And that would have been good, wouldn't it? Because David could have said amen, and he could have died and gone. So never mind, you know the Jewish people, when they were crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ, they said, oh, crucify him, crucify him. Let the sins be upon us and our children. What a foolish bunch of people. But God is a good God who blesses us and keeps his covenant of love to a thousand generations. So the covenant that he has for you of love, of protection, of hope, of healing, of, of being there for you, it is forever. Amen. This covenant never dies. And in the same manner, we must, as Pastor likes to say, we must begin to shave our brains. We must train ourselves and take the word because the word is clear. At least it's in plain English. Thank God that it's not in Latin. The Latin is now extinct. I do know that there's some, still some. What did the priest say? I have no idea. Amen. But we thank the Lord for all the translations. Thank God for King James. That we can now read in our own English. He said it wasn't so from the beginning. And he says that, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Let nobody put asunder. <clears throat> 
God is telling you and I that he has come into a covenant relationship with you and I. He has married us. And that is why he said, your name is Beulah. Beulah means married. When we read Isaiah, he said, your name is Hepzibah, means my delight is in you. And that is the name God himself has given you and I. And now we spoke a lot about changing of name. That God himself said, what is your name? He said, oh, my name is Dorothy. He said, you know what? I'm going to call you Beulah. I'm going to call you Hepzibah. He's changed our name because he is really the name that he's given us is reflecting the covenant relationship that he's in with you and I, that he has entered into just like we, I gave a, I spoke at length about marrying and how women take on the names of their husbands and God is calling you and I say that. so I have come into that relationship covenant relationship with you in marriage let no man separate and that no man, many a time when we, we, we read or we hear marriages, I don't know about you, when you hear that vows, let no one put asunder, let no man put asunder. Many a times you think of an outsider, don't you? Yeah? Because if in a marriage somebody's going to put it asunder, you expect that somebody else is going to come from outside and intervene in the relationship. Yeah? So that's the normal one. So let's go. Yes, of course, you know that the devil is outside of your covenantal relationship. The devil is like that one. You know, some people are so full of evil that literally what they do is that they, get to, they look at a married woman, then they say to themselves, that's the one that I want. When you know that that person is married, or they look at a married man, they say, that's the one that I want. And you know, they believe in their female charms or their male charms so much that they will, they will persist persevere to do evil, to go for that one that does not belong to them. And that is evil in God's sight. Anytime God tells us that, that's why he said, do not covet your neighbor's wife. Do not covet your neighbor's this and your neighbor's that. Because God is telling you another in covenant relationship, you don't go out for what does not belong to you. And so in covenant relationship, the outsider is looking to break you apart. Because the devil has looked at you and located you and said, that one is good. That one is good, but I want her for myself. I want him for myself. When you are a child of God in a covenantal relationship with God, so the devil, let no man put asunder, is going to come and try and do what take you. And that's what Peter writes. He said that, watch out, for the enemy is like a roaring lion. He's looking about. He's going about, seeing, seeking for that whom he can do what? Devour. Again, that is like that word asunder. The devil is looking to break that covenant relationship. So just like if you were in a marital relationship, somebody is seeking to woo you. Some of us, we just get so excited. So, oh, it's so nice. Oh, then no harm is meant. If you're in that position, you must make sure that you deal ruthlessly with that particular person. Hello? Because that's what the devil does. He just you know, plays with your little, 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 before you knew it, he stepped into that relationship and that relationship is broken. Remember, we're still talking covenant. Let no one put asunder. The one from outside, the devil is looking for whom he can devour. The devil is looking to yum you up, eat you and drink water on you. He's looking to put you down. Nobody is, is devoid of the devil's devices. But we thank God for his spirit. Amen. And we thank God for his covenant relationship. That as we remain in him, he remains in us. And then we will abide in him, he abides in us. Then we can ask anything and we'll get it. Then we can be transformed like him. We can look just like him. So even when the devil comes, there'll be like a shield around him. For the Lord is our strong tower. He is our shield. He's our rock and he's our fortress. And the Psalm 91 says, my God in whom I trust. If you, when you go home, read Psalm 91. How did they say? He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 2. I will say of the Lord, very interesting. He starts by talking about somebody else. He who dwells, anybody who dwells in the sacred place of the Most High, will abide under the shadow of my verse two. He changes. So you think, ah, this guy is not writing this thing properly. He said, I will say of the Lord, he is my rock and my fortress. He says, my God in whom I trust. Powerful. Because the psalmist is writing, I think it was Moses that wrote it, whoever wrote it, he's saying that anybody who dwells, but he himself is saying, I have that covenant relationship with him. But as I declare him as Lord, my God and my refuge, but the God in whom I trust, then I can anything, there will nothing will be able to touch me because he is in a covenant relationship. 
There's no good just dwelling knowing about God. But if you say, he says, I will say of the Lord, he is my rock and my salvation. I am in my covenant relationship. He is my husband. He is my Lord. He is my rock. Not so and so's rock. Not so and so. He is my fortress. And all those things are rock, fortress, are things that cover. Things that protect. So that protection comes when we are in covenant relationship. The hiding comes when we are in covenant relationship. So the enemy is seeking whom he may devour. But if you make him the Lord, who your refuge, the one that you run into, if you make him your fortress, these are all military terms, your fortress that is high, that goes under you, and he was my fortress, my God, in whom you do what? Place your trust in. Guess what? Nobody will be able to put you asunder from that relationship because because you are hidden in his enclave, in the palm of his hand. But I for I've placed you in the palm of my hand. And nothing and nobody can pluck you out. That's a covenantal relationship, just like in a marriage. He said, let no one separate. Let no one put asunder. In the same vein, like I said, we always talk about the outsider. What about those already in the relationship? Again, if you look at a marriage, sometimes a marriage will break down. Why? Because one party in the marriage has just decided that me, I'm not going to understand this. They just behave like their brain is on holiday. They're taking their brain out. Everything you do, oh, I don't want this. Why is this all about you? Why do you always, why, why, why? Next minute, the person that the other person married has just changed completely. They don't want to play ball. And then you'll notice little by little the relationship. Then that's why when you get to a divorce, they say, uh, we cite irreconcilable differences. What's that about? It means that we just cannot reason together. We, he, that person, literally, they're telling you that the other party has gone insane because I don't recognize them. That's what they're saying, irreconcilable differences. So the gap is so wide that we just, we, we, we can't relate. If I tell them, oh, let's do this, ah, but that's such a bad idea. Don't you know that Johnny and Jane did it and did it? Why would you want to do that? No, I'm not doing it. You can do it. I'm not doing it. I don't care. Do whatever you want. You are putting the relationship with asunder. Not actually preferring and honoring one to another. The Bible says that we should honor one another. Put somebody above one another. Amen. So in a marital relationship, that's what you do. So in, when we're in relationship with God, it's important that we honor him and we put him above. In a relationship, it's very possible. If you, those of us who are married, you know, sometimes in the middle of the night, your husband, your wife might say to you, oh, honey, can you get up and go and get me a glass of water? It happens to me all the time. And in that few moments, I'm thinking, uh, what's wrong with you? Okay. Do you understand? When you have a voice, you could also say, you know what, the last time I checked, you had two hands and you had ten fingers and you had two feet the same way like me. Get up and get your water. That is putting the relationship asunder. So what am I saying? What I'm saying to you is that while we're in a covenant relationship, it's very possible that we could be sleeping in the middle of the night and God could just wake us up and say, get up and go downstairs and get me a glass of water. What are you going to do? Remember, you're in a marital relationship. It's very possible that you could be sleeping deep in your sleep and then he's going to wake you up and say, get up and let's do something. Let's have an intimate relationship. Oops. Well, God, I was sleeping. Why is it I have to get up now and have an intimate? I'm talking about prayer, folks. Worship. <laughs> it is very possible. That in that covenant relationship, God's going to nudge you. Amen? And say, this time, I want you to get up. I want you to just love on me. I want you to worship. But it's 3 a.m. And that 3 a.m. seems to be the heightened time of sweet sleep, isn't it? It's always better about 3. <laughs> if you get woken up by anything at 3, you get so cross. Because that was just when you're getting to your peak. So we're in that covenant relationship. And so God is telling you, Anna, let no one separate. And that one could be an external force. That's the devil's job. He wants to get you. But if you commit yourself and stay under his covenant and in his covenant, then he can't get you. But what about you and I? God is calling you and I that here. I'm in a covenant relationship with you. Because I'm in a covenant relationship and I put myself out for you, at some point I will place a demand on you. 
At some point, I also expect you to put yourself out for me. Hango, hanka. At some time, I may ask you to fast. I may ask you to come to church early. It may be that a prayer meeting might be called, which does not suit you. But I want you to do that. It's very possible that you may have to stay on afterwards. While everybody's poured this water or whatever, I expect you to clean. That's the covenant relationship that I have for you. We all have individual commands and individual instructions. However it goes, God is calling you and those of us on the internet, wherever we are, we are in a marital relationship. From the very beginning, God's idea was for you and I to be in a marital relationship with him. A covenant that's everlasting till death that do us part. That goes on forever. And there's a song that uh, we, we used to sing uh, all the time. It says, and when eternity comes and starts over again. I remember once person having a question, that, that makes sense. It's eternity end. But you know what the uh, hymn writer is trying to sing. That it all, and all, throughout eternity, I will praise you. Amen. This is the covenant relationship that God is requiring of you and I. Are we ready to go deeper in that relationship? Because he does require it of us. It wasn't so at the beginning. God does not mean for us to write a bill of divorce. Ah, this is my decree nice for everything. No, I've divorced you, God. I've divorced you. Here's your ring. Take it. I'm walking around ringless. Many times, those that's what we're doing. We're giving God's ring back to him. Some of us are even throwing it back to him. Just like somebody who's married and no longer wears a ring. Immediately you see them. They don't have that ring to show that they're married. Oh, okay. They're saying, I'm free. And you, when you break covenant, you're saying to the devil, I'm free. Come marry me. Hello? Hello? Because you, your, your symbol of marriage, I'm not saying, I mean, most married people wear married rings. If you're not wear one, don't worry, but you know what I'm saying. That this is the symbol of your marriage. You've taken it off, so you're saying to everybody, I'm available. But when we keep to covenant, we put on our ring. I remember once I was driving my car, and this guy, some guy looked at me in the car. I, think, I wasn't sure whether he was fancying the car or me. Then he looked at me, and I was thinking, what's he looking at? And then he went to me. Then I went, then went, ah. <laughs> At least he was decent enough to ask. So, because I was wondering, what's, what's he doing? Pulled up on me looking very, so I was thinking, well, what's he looking? Is it the car or the whole person in the car? So he goes like this. So as soon as I lift up my hands, so, ah, she belongs to somebody else. Amen. It's time for us to lift up our hands. Our covenant symbol to say God to you I belong my life doesn't belong to me but I am yours and throughout eternity I will keep the covenant because that is what the Lord requires of you and I you want to rise as we bring our service to a close our mission is raising overcomers setting the captives free Freedom Center International is here to support you in every step that you take with the Word of God as you seek spiritual and emotional wholeness. And we hope you've been blessed by today's message. Worship with us at 38 Upper Wickham Lane, Welling, Kent, DA16 3HF or give us a call on 0207-277-8700. You can also visit us online at fcichapel.org. And remember, there is progress in freedom.